Hello, my name is Myung Hee Na from iMac. Welcome to the tutorial. The topic of today in this talk is innovative technology element to enable CMOS scaling beyond 3 nanometers. I hope you enjoy the tutorial. 2021, 2020 and 2021 actually together, what we can say. This is a very unusual time. And one thing actually I can tell is that I'm spending a lot more time with my actual devices. I use much more in the mobile devices, tablet and the smart TV. Not only streaming Netflix or Amazon, I actually use this device to connect my life to the external world. So working remotely versus on-site, social connectedness versus physical distancing increases the demand of edge and cloud computing up to the extreme. I think the business community agrees with that. Market and market analysis actually shows that there is a substantial growth of the cloud market in 2021 is expected. So this is really good news for our industry. So semiconductor device and technology are high demand because of actually market growth is substantial. But personally for me, what really excites me is that our technology, the one we actually are dedicated to build are fundamental to bring the society together as a one. And that really social generating social connectedness is really something I'm um, careful dearly and actually I'm very proud to be a part of that uh, movement. So compute demand actually has been increasing substantially even before COVID. COVID accelerates and changes the direction a little bit, but it's not new. What you are actually seeing is here is the dye area versus transistor density. The transistor goes, um, the transistor dye area goes down and depending on the functionality it can actually go up um, a little bit uh, if you want to add more functions. But general trend is that dye gets small, total density of transistor goes up. So you pack much smaller devices, much more devices in there. So. This is very exciting and interesting. Density scaling is continuing and demand is there. Another part actually we do notice is that through the reverse engineering of the mobile processor, these two examples are Qualcomm and Huawei Green uh, chips. They are very heterogeneous cores, not only actually the multi-cores, but it uses a GPU or a neural processor or a CPU. Multiple of these actually are combined and work very um, homogeneously or uh, uh, syn synergetically working together to bring up the performance of the system. So what I can tell you is that demand of density scaling and compute continues. And what we see in everywhere is the heterogeneity. Heterogeneous system integration, how to integrate multiple cores and heterogeneous cores together very um, synergetic way. And heterogeneous technology using 3D technology, how to enable that in basis of CMOS technology platform is going to be an important question for all of us to answer. Let's briefly look at semiconductor history and technology landscape. The high care introduction really started actually our industry in a very different um, innovation uh, stage. The new material introduction using a 32 and 28 and now nano sheet and 3 nanometer adaptation of some foundry. This is a very exciting time. Throughout the year what we have noticed is that technology innovation is not sufficient. We need to innovate in the context of the design and system and that has been the journey we actually are walking. Now, I think the grand task is that what is that element which can truly benefit system performance in 2 nanometer and 1.5 nanometer and 1 nanometer? And can we close the gap? I think this is the grand challenge for all of us and really exciting time for us to be in this, um, in this uh, time, in this actually technology uh, landscape. Before we deep dive in the topics, I'd like to just give you an overview of what we are going to talk about. We are going to talk about two pillars. One pillar is the technology element itself. The other one is how to connect them together. In technology element, I'm going to talk about four different aspects. There are a lot more of that, but I think we will have enough time to just talk about four topics. One, 
how to deliver power, smart power delivery system. The second is device architecture, pushing fundamental device physics to the extreme dimensions. Parasitics. The goal is very simple. Make it as small as possible, as low RC possible. That's the really goal of parasitics. Materials. Can we look at beyond, uh, beyond silicon? I think that's an interesting question, right? And how to evaluate them together when actual disruption is happening is a very important question. We are going to propose rapid and accurate power performance evaluation metric um, in this actual talk at the end, and that's going to be all combining together. Power, power, power is the first topic. Power is really important in every computing domain, as we know, right? High performance computers have different requirements. Extreme low power computers are another requirement. But nonetheless, power is a limiting factor. There are many ways to talk about power and uh, tackle the power issues. Um, not to generate the power, remove the power, or actually deliver the power. Today, we are going to talk about power delivery, smart power delivery, using Barry Power Rail and Backside Power Distribution Network. Before we talk about Barry Power Rail, let's talk about what's currently practiced. What you are looking at is the cross section of the six track with a standard power rail. So you know this is now with a with, this is now with a very power rail. So what is the standard power rail? Standard power rail is actually the metal routing layer in up there, which is much larger than minimum dimensions of the technology. So they are typically larger because they want to deliver power much more efficiently without um without IR drops. So you can easily imagine, right, if you want to um, continue to scale the track height, you will have a problem because this is not going to scale that much. So the routability, the routing access to the internal track is going to be very limited when you actually have two larger uh, metal lines there to deliver the power. So the idea is very simple. What about burying the powers underneath STI? So let's actually bury the power under SDI. Now what you have what it happens is that the routing is actually getting freed because they are not used anymore of the power delivery system. You have a full access of the full internal track, although you um, shrink the track height by six track to five track. So BPR actually enables track height scaling without compromising internal track um, track access, and that's the really exciting part of the BPR. At the same time, because it's buried underneath, the aspect ratio is not really limited, as long as you can go as deep as actually you want to. What does that mean? Electrically, you can lower the BPR resistance, which means that you can mitigate the IR ultra much more efficiently. Talk about what are the key features of Barry Power Rail. So this is a cross section, it's a cartoon. As you can actually see that the power currently in the conventionally delivered from the top because it's actually the metal line above is delivering the power. What you're actually seeing here is that power need to deliver to the battery power rail and then actually need to be uh, delivered to the device. Since power need to be delivered from the top, what you actually need is a via, via connecting BPR, uh, connecting BPR to the actually the middle of line. That's actually what's needed. So when you talk about BPR, the battery power rail, you actually need to talk about via connecting to middle of line to the BPR. And the resistance of BPR is going to be very important. The key dimensions we studied here in IMAC 3 nanometers, actually gate pitch is about 42 nanometers, while metal pitch 18 nanometers. What is important here is actually BPRCD. BPRCD is 33 nanometers. It's pretty wide CD because it's buried underneath the STI. BBPR actually um, is much tinier because it needs to be integrated in the middle of the line. So it's actually uh, 18 by 12. Very easily, uh, you can imagine, right? The resistance of the VIA is going to be main issue. And that's what actually needs to be reduced further in order to deliver power much more efficiently. Let's look at where BPR and BBPR are integrated in the process flow. So BPR actually is integrated very early stage of front end line, right? After STI fill and CMP, BPR patterning and the metallization is happening, and then actually fin rebuild. So 
as you can see, it's very important that BPR metal clean and BPR whole process and choice of metal need to be compatible to front end or process due to the contamination issue and thermal budget issue. And this is one of the critical matter for BPR process flow to address. Uh, next, let's actually look at the uh, VBPR. VBPR is different because it need to connect the middle of the line to the BPR. So it actually is integrated right after RMG module and the middle of the line section and the middle of the line actually edge um, the patterning and then actually BBPR retho and then edge and the fill and then the CMP. As you can see here, the BBPR is tiny and the FB, um, the BBPR process is very critical because there are very tight margin between the right next to FB to M0A on the um, where the uh, gen M0A is. So post VBPR edge clean on FB and impact of the interface between a BPR is going to be extremely important and that's so where we gotta continue to look at. The reason we are doing BPR as well as VBPR is actually reducing the resistance. Of course, the area scaling perspective is actually very attractive as well. The choice of the metal we are looking into at this point is tungsten and ruthenium. There are several issues we got to actually study. As I mentioned before, front end line, thermal budget and the contamination is, is one of the key issues. At the same time, you got to recess the metal, right? So you, you need to be able to add the metal. Another part is the line resistance is going to be key. The BBPR is a slightly different. You actually are looking at um, the middle of line compatibility. So all of um, thermal budget and the process need to be compatible to middle of line. Same time, the metal need to be recessed as well. And the VR resistance, especially the VR resistance is going to be key. So when we look at it, um, cobalt and tungsten are jumping up as a first candidate. Why? Because these are the commercially used and commonly used in the middle of the line and actually current advanced CMOS technology platform. However, reduce the resistance further, we really are looking forward with the ruthenium and molybdenum because they have a very uh, promising result for line and VR resistance reduction. The challenges are there. We are continuing to investigate actually these two materials to enable the next generation of BPR and BBPR. We successfully demonstrate tungsten BPR integration with the FinFET flow. As you can see in the cross section in the left, the BPR is formed nicely along with the FinFET and then source strain. So this is actually very encouraging news. One of the things as a device design point what we are looking at is impact of BPR on device. The, so the, actually the goal is don't see any impact, right? That's the, really the goal. But the question is, should, do we see it, right? So there are various of actually the BPR process uh, experiment was um, done to compare with the no BPR for device impact. So what we are actually seeing here is NFET and PFET ion versus psi off curve with a BPR case, which is black, and two different conditions of the BPR. And in this case, actually, BPR depth was controlled, so that it controls the volume of the BPR metals. And we see uh, almost uh, um, no impact of the device as far as we can actually tell from the electrical measurement. So this is very encouraging news is, um, that the BPR process is not introducing any unintended device um, um, characteristic changes. Next step to tungsten is going to be ruthenium. Enabling ruthenium in BPR module, I think that's going to be important um, the experiment to run. So what we are actually shown here is a resistance versus a BPR total area. Um, depend on the graph. So the total area is shown in the x-axis and resistance per um, uh, micron is actually shown in the y-axis. So there are two experiments run with the ruthenium and tungsten. At target CD about 33 nanometers, that's actually BPR CD. Our target resistance is uh, 50 ohm per micron. We can achieve this actually 50 ohm per micron, both tungsten and ruthenium, but different aspect ratio. And ruthenium is much shorter, which is 85 versus tungsten is 140 nanometer, much taller. 
So there are advantages of ruthenium using, um, used in the BPR. You can actually make a process easiness using a lower aspect ratio, or by going deeper and going higher aspect ratio, you can reduce further in the resistance. So it's possible to reduce below 50 ohm per micron of the BPR resistance. And that's very exciting to move forward in the next step of the BPR. Another important part of a uh, uh, BPR module is actually the VBPR. So let's look at the VBPR resistance and how it's reacting uh, with the different experiment. So what you're actually seeing here is a short loop cross section. Um, the VBPR here is a bottom CD about 20 nanometers on the top of a tungsten BPR. And this process is mimicked, so you can actually see taper process, um, taper profile of the VBPR. But in um, later on, in 20.3 in IDM, I'm sure we show you actually this tape prof profile is corrected and then you can actually still meet the 3 nanometer target and that actually can, will be discussed in this talk. Today, what I'd like to talk about is that sensitivity of two important DOEs. One, tie nitrate thickness of the barrier. As within the tie nitrate thickness, we need to see the response of the BPR, uh, VBPR resistance. And we actually see that when we uh, thin the two nanometer of thickness, we actually see about 24 ohm of the reduction. Another part is actually the VPR height. So when you reduce the VBPR height by about uh, 30 nanometers, we actually see the response as well. So the shorter VBPR height, the better it's going to be. But the integration wise, that's not actually very trivial because it needs to be integrated with after FB and the, during the M0 pro, M0A process, which is middle of line process. So optimizing VBPR height as short as possible without compromising the integrity of the FB and um, middle of line is going to be a very important manner of to address for the VBPR resistance reduction. Since we are talking about metals, electron migration is extremely important, especially when you talk about two different metals, right? So for experiment we have done before, it's a tungsten BPR with a ruthenium BVPR. So looking at the interface is going to be very important, the electron migration of that. So first we start um, experiment, we need to confirm that actually BPR and um, BVPR metal composition and then CD in order to um, quantify actually the interface impact. You can see see that actually bottom CD is about 20 nanometers is formed and the ruthenium and the tungsten in the um, BPR and the VBPR is actually yeah, nicely formed there. When we did the electric, um, um, electron migration test and we see about 320 hours, we don't see any fails. So that indicates that the interface between ruthenium and tungsten are very stable. And it's, it's actually very uh, um, encouraging news that actually when you have a hybrid, hybrid metal between a BPR and VBPR, you can still um, maintain good interface without electro migration issues. Another important issue of very power rail is actually how it's related to how the uh, power is delivered. As we discussed, power currently is delivered from the top. So you actually need to go through the top to the BPR and the device. That means actually there is a tap cell, additional front end tap cell is needed when you deliver the power from the top. And that tap cell does not, um, it's not there in the standard cell template. So cell scaling is not enough. What you gotta see is the block level scaling. So it need to be validated. So that's what we have done in next. So we use the ARM core to understand the block level assessment of uh, BPR. So what you are actually seeing here, six track without BPR, five track with BPR, and this is a heat map, IR drum map. Um, it's a visual map. So the green or yellowish color is a warmer and the blue is cold. And visually you can actually see the five track is much colder. When we look at the IR drop CDF plot, you can actually see between a six track, which is the green, to five track, which is actually with the BPR, the blue, you can see above 40% reduction at 99 percentile of IR drop. And this is very encouraging news. With this result, what we also confirmed is that 14% core area scaling is achieved using five track from the six track reference library. 
that means we can actually take advantage of the area scaling from six track to five track substantial area scaling due to the track height scaling as well as the IR drop reduction due to the BPR introduction. And this is very motivating result to in, um, introduce BPR in much further stage in the next. So, so far we discussed about very power rail and then power was delivered from the top. But nature of the very power rail actually really calls for power delivery from the backside. So we investigate backside PDN um, as a, one option. So you bond the wafer and you grind the, uh, the, the wafer very, very thin, about 300 to 500. And you actually fabricate the nano TSV and backside metal in the backside of the wafer. When you do that, I think you can actually see very easily that um, you gotta have a very aggressive dimension of nano TSV because it's connecting to the device or train. So the dimension of nano TSV is not typical TSV we actually have known. So dimensions are 150 by 110 of our CDs and then 500 meters of our height. And this is actually the target we are trying to achieve uh, in the fabricating uh, iMac for nano TSV to connecting the BPR. So let's look at the general process flow of the backside PDN. As I briefly mentioned, right, really briefly mentioned, the extreme wafer thinning is needed. So you start from the silicon wafer. This is case actually the metal um, is mimicking what the BPR, um, um, BPR actually presence here. And you start from here, you uh, bond the wafer to um, the secondary wafer. This can be actually the memory wafer or any kind of uh, donor wafers. Um, this, you bond the wafer and you grind very thinly uh, up, to, up to the selective edge stop layer and then you remove that and then you can actually remove the buffer. So you end up very thin silicon about 300 to 500 nanometers. That's actually very key for nano TSB formation. After that, you basically do passivation of the backside and you uh, make, um, pattern the nano TSB um, processing and then actually you do a single demo in back end metal. So you, you typically do two or three stacks depending on the power distribution network and that can be evaluated. What's really important is the nano TSV need to land very nicely on the BPR. So overlay between a nano TSV and BPR is going to be important and nano TSV to back end metal is going to be extremely important as well. So tight overlay is actually required in both cases. So Let's look at some cross-section and some experiment data about the nano TSB and backside process. So you can actually see that these are two cross-sections and two sections of the cross-sections are after trench edge and after trench film. What you can actually see is that our copper TSB is landing nicely on tungsten BPR and then backside um, metal is actually landing nicely on copper TSV. So the margin looks pretty good. And there is a good isolation where the actually the silicon to backside metal and that's very important. So when we look at this, where well, we actually um, did a lot of multiple studies overlay as, I, as we discussed a little bit, backside metal to nano TSV alignment is extremely important. Overlay margin need to be tight. We achieved about five nanometer overlay, uh, less than five nanometer overlay. They ought to be precise for multiple wafers uh, between our, our backside metal one to TSV formation. And I think we are very encouraged by this news. One of the important part of the nano TSV is going to be a resistance. So this study is actually done with a copper um, film. The resistance need to be uh, small enough not to impact any of the power uh, delivery systems. So nano TSV resistance in the manner is very key. So we measure in the Kelvin structure. What's so unique about it is that we calculated or we expected about one ohms of nano TSV resistance in the Kelvin structure. While what we actually measure is five to seven. Yeah, compared to BPR resistance, it's not that high, but nonetheless, it's about five to seven X higher than what is expected. And we are very puzzled. 
So we slap, start calibrating the model, understand the physical behavior of this uh, higher nano TSV uh, resistance. So two cross sections we have looked at is actually 500 uh, nanometer height and the 730 nanometer height in the different cities. And we calibrate the model when we try to understand where is the physical mechanism of this increase of the nano TSV is coming. What we found out is that actually it's not about nano TSV resistance itself. Actually, it's a spreading resistance through the BPR because the BPR resistance is dominant. So the minimizing spreading resistance by minimizing BPR resistance is going to be extremely important manner for reducing overall stack of nano TSV. And that's going to be the next challenge we are continuing to optimize along with the BPR and nano TSV model together. So. Fortunately or unfortunately, Backside PDN and BPR, both of them requires um, block level assessment in order to understand the area uh, scaling and IR drop because of the nature is actually requires a scaled up uh, the assessment, right? So what we actually used is the ARM core in using IMAC 3 nanometer technologies. What you are actually seeing here is a heat map as you have seen before, six track without BPR and the front side PDN, positive distribution network, five track with the BPR with the front side uh, PDN, five track with the BPR with the back side PDN. Actually, you can see visually five track with the BPR and back side PDN looks much cooler than anything else. Let's quantify that. What you are actually seeing here is normalized core area is x-axis. Y-axis is IR drum measured at 98 percentile. So six track, no BPR is a reference point. So it start with the 45 millivolts of the IR drop at 98 percentile and area core area is one. When you scale from the six track to five track, we see 19 percent area scaling and 10 millivolts of IR drop reduction. 19% area scaling is extremely interesting because that means actually we get full benefit from the track standard cell track high scaling to block level scaling. So this is very exciting news that you can claim the full area entitlement. And IR drop 10 millivolts um, reduction is actually important as well. When you do five track BPR at front side with the back side with the BPR, you can actually see area doesn't change much, but you reduce uh, additional 10 millivolts of IR drop. So total, what you are actually seeing is the five track BPR with the backside PDM reduced this IR drop by 45% with respect to the reference, which is six track without BPR and front side. In addition to that, about 90% of the area scaling is observed. And this is a really powerful uh, statement of the area scaling perspective as well as actually power delivery system. And this is the main reason we really believe the backside PDN is important metric for high performance compute as well as actually low power compute um, to be optimized. Okay, short break. Let's summarize a little bit what we have just actually discussed. Very power L enables standard cell scaling from six track to five track um, without compromising internal track um, access. That's really good news. But very power, the nature of the very power is buried. It's much more natural way to deliver power is backside PDN. Backside PDN along with the BPR can reduce IR drop significantly compared with the standard way to deliver power, which is a front side PDN without BPR. Next topic, shifting a little bit of gear. The question is, are there device architecture beyond FinFET? Or should I just say, are there device architecture beyond nanosheet? Let's start asking fundamental questions for device design. There are four questions in my mind, actually very fundamental for any architecture. One, the short channel effect. Improve the short channel effect without compromising reliability. It's not team version scaling only. It's a reliable team version with the actual short channel impact. Another part, it's actually this is um, new in terms of the fin, uh, introduction of FinFET because FinFET has such a large footprint, uh, double effective footprint. The new device architecture really need to compete with a large double effective footprint. And this is a really daunting task as you define the technology. Third, it's a performance potential. 
What do I mean by that? This is twofold. One, transport. You need to have a high mobility or uh, much better improve the transport in terms of materials. The second, resistance reduction. is a contact resistance reduction, spreading resistance reduction at the area. So all of this is actually very important for device fundamentals. How to integrate them? At the end of the day, you want to make a device. Integration complexity needs to be always considered for the uh, device design perspective. So let's look at the FinFET. FinFET has been wonderful, to be honest. When FinFET was introduced by Intel in the beginning, you know, it was just the beginning of a new chapter of the device architecture. Since then, a lot of device architecture has been studied and looked at as well, right? FinFET was tall, so we can actually make a taller and thinner and closer. But now we are hitting the limit because N and P spacing is not reducing any further because of that you cannot really squeeze too much of the track height without really compromising NMP spacing so you got to depopulate the fin as you scale the track height so now when we are looking at five track we are looking at one fin what does that mean fin depopulation has actually quite a few challenges one is just the absolute device strength is going to be weak the second the variability due to the layout effect in a single fin is going to be a very big issue. So device strength and variability is going to be really limiting fin fat moving forward beyond the 3 nanometers. So let's look at the next generation of the device architecture. Industry has already announced and some founders actually said that they will start introducing nano sheet in 3 nanometers. So what is the nano sheet, right? Nano sheet is very actually simple. It's a gate all around structure. So really the take advantage of the gate all around structure, but the width is maximized as fat, as much as it could without compromising short channel effect of the gate all around structure. Because of that, the W effect is very competitive to fin fat or it uh, actually can be overachieved depending on, on the device design. At the same time, the width can be modulated within the limit of the processes. So that means actually designers has another flexibility to vary the device width for power performance trade-off. So this is exciting options for um, the designers as well as actually device design architecture perspective. So NanoSheet has been already introduced to the industry. Let's actually look forward. What's the beyond NanoSheet? We believe actually iMac has option for fork sheet. Fork sheet is the evolution from nano sheet and we will discuss that at this, um, in the few slides. But looking at actually the fin fat to nano sheet to fork sheet, really major device changes are the device architecture from single device to the CMOS device architecture. And this is very subtle, but you will actually see what I mean as we move forward. So let's talk about the fork sheet a little more in details. So fork sheet is ultimate 2D device uh, architecture. Um, what, do that, what do I mean by that? Because it really uses up all of the uh, space in the actually silicon surface in 2D dimensions, right? So how it's done, this is actually done with a dielectric wall insertion in the beginning. So you basically insert between the NMP spacing, the dielectric wall. By introducing the dielectric wall, you can actually push them together much closer because there is a physical barrier. By doing so, what you actually are doing is that you can make a much tighter NMP spacing. So as you can see, why I'm saying actually it's ultimate 2D device architecture, right? It's ultimate solution for 2D spacing. Because of the presence of the electric wall, you can actually simplify a few things. One is that your ship patterning and the uh, RMG patterning, and we will talk about that very briefly on that. But the physical barrier of the electric wall really simplifies some of the processes. Of course, there are challenges uh, in, the, in, the, in the process flow as well. Before we talk about details of, of uh, fork challenges, we need to know why we are doing fork sheet, right? I think you, what you are looking at here is that inverter, in this case is the inverter RO, fan out, um, uh, fan out of three, and the one finger device of the VDD um, of 0.85. So nano sheet versus fork sheet of frequency versus power. You can see about 10% of the frequency gain at constant power. Where does it come from? It comes from Miller cap reduction due to the dielectric wall, and then actually gate cut, um, 
natural gate card. So this really um, shows the promises or entitlement, I would say, the capacitance reduction, which actually can uh, reduce the power substantially so uh, and actually improve the performance, right? Go back to the fundamentals. We got to ask these four questions. And two questions jump up in the fork sheet. And I don't have to tell you why, because fork sheet has dielectric wall, which means actually become trigate. The short channel control is going to be a questionable. And that's what I we're going to show a little bit. And then W effective for footprint. So you, because of you actually push the MP spacing, you can increase W effective, or you can actually decrease the W effective depending on how you want to do it. So that's actually going to be the question I think we need to explore. So fork sheet actually has a tri gate because one side of the gate is blocked by the electric wall. So that actually the concern being tri gate again is actually a valid concern. What we have shown here is actually the IDVG uh, of the um, ticket simulation of the fork sheet. As you can see that there is a degradation. Swing is degraded by three to four millivolt per decade due to the lack of uh, one side of gate. And then need to be optimized. And we will look to the options to how to actually recover this loss of short channel effect. One of the ways um, to recover the short channel effect due to uh, the lack of the one side gate is actually the recess. You basically recess the um, silicon a little bit, uh, and then you basically form the gate control at the edge much more tightly. By doing so, you can recover most of the short channel uh, loss due to the tri gate. It's looking like actually omega gate, we call here is a pi gate in the uh, fork sheet com uh, conventions. But what actually need to be understood at the same time is that when you actually recess channel um, a little bit to get in control the, at the uh, corner, you will lose W effective. The trade-off between a W effective and short channel gain at the fork sheet architecture is going to be important. And how much, precisely how much recess we got to do is really depend on the trade-off between these two parameters. One of the really exciting factor of the fork shift for me is the flexibility. Now, the spacing, NP spacing, which was widely open, widely actually, sorry, closed before, now it's open to use. How do you want to use it? There are many ways to probably use it, but we can actually come up with three different ways. One, C effective optimization. You use that space for C effective. What does that mean? That means you actually take a capacitance gain and you don't change anything. You can just use a very similar layout style with the nano shape, but you can take advantage of performance and power. Or you tighten up the space, but extra space you use for the width of the device, which means you can actually increase the width to in improve the drivability. And for high performance uh, solutions, this is really a, um, attractive solutions. Or you have a space I would rather want to use a track high scaling. So in this uh, specific design rules, we actually uh, shrink down up to 4.4 track height. So the area scaling, the track height scaling is possible. So various uh, op options are available with the fork sheet. And that's really the exciting part of the fork sheet. Fork sheet process flow is actually very similar to the nano sheet um, with uh, some differences. One is really, the dielectric wall formation. After stack reveal, you actually form the dielectric wall. And then because of it's actually introduced a very early stage, dielectric wall material um, quality is very important because you need to go through a lot of different steps throughout the middle of line and then um, until actually the middle of line. So it really requires a very good quality of the materials. And we are looking at very carefully on that material selection and robustness of the dielectric wall. And from the introduction of dielectric wall, what that means actually subsequent process related to dielectric wall need to be modified. It's a modified step. It's not a humongous different step, but there is a um, different step. Inner spacer, source drain, and RMG are the key steps actually we are watching out for. Let's look into dielectric wall integration a little bit. Right? After the nine nano sheet reveal, you actually um, do the deposition and then isotropic edge and then the oxidation. 
because of the this wall is placed and actually um, will be processed throughout sequential processes, it's very important that, especially steps for FB and RMG, the heart must patterning without minimize the dielectric wall loss so that we can actually have a, a robust dielectric wall is going to be very um, critical. At the same time, you know, wall formation, the isotrophic edge is going to be very key because uh, you need to etch out except actually the between the NMP devices where it belongs. One of the key modules uh, which are different would need to be modified from the nano sheet is actually um, the RMG modules, work function patterning, right? So in the nano sheet, you will need a high aspect ratio or hard mass patterning in order to actually go through all of the stacks and then actually remove the metal. So work function metal stacks actually much higher in here. While actually a fork sheet case actually is, can be pretty uh, lower, and no aspect ratio or hard mass patterning is needed because of the presence of the dielectric wall. So this is actually simplifies the RMG patterning process of the fork sheet significantly. So we are very excited to show the first fork sheet module, key module, which is dielectric wall and then RMG module actually result here. We demonstrate the structure demonstration of the fork sheet with the NMP spacing of 17 nanometers. As you can actually see, very nice coverage between um, um, the different actually the work function metals between the sheet and all, um, along the sheet, and actually with the MP spacing of N, M, uh, 17 nanometers. So we are very encouraged and we will continue to study further in the fork sheet modules. When you talk about MP spacing, what you actually can just imagine is SRM B cell scaling, right? Because the SRM B cell scaling is limited by a lot of them is actually MP spacing. Tightening up MP spacing really opens the opportunity for SRM B cell scaling. This is actually high performance SRM B cell and it's a cartoon here. You can actually see up to about 20% of the area scaling can be uh, observed between the nano sheet and fork sheet. But due to the MP spacing tightening and the natural gate cut, because the dielectric wall side is actually giving a very na nice natural gate cut there. When we look at the high density cell, we see the same result. So about 20 to 30 percent of um, SRM cell scaling, depending on what whether it's a performance cell or density cell, we actually see nice scaling of SRM. So SRM scaling is possible with the fork sheet, and that's really exciting for area scaling perspective. The promises of area scaling is not only for SRAM, it's actually in logic as well. What we are going to show you is actually flip-flop because this is one of the limiting uh, standard cell scaling. Compared with the nano sheet, FinFed, and fork sheet, due to the um, width, uh, larger width of the nano sheet, actually the design dimensions is very difficult to introduce a middle um, gate cut in the middle because of that dummy poly is needed for nano sheet while actually Sheet, you don't need the dummy poly because actually the electric wall presence. The second, what actually is that because of your uh, fish, um, the fork sheet, you actually don't have to cut all the way down because you have dielectric wall in between. So you can actually place the gate contact in anywhere with independent of the gate cut. So it actually free up to center tracks. So you can actually use that center tracks or two center tracks for the full routing. About 20% of the area scaling is observed um, in, for flip-flop cells, and this is actually a very uh, promising result for fork sheet value proposition for area scaling. Now let's see the CFET. CFET is a revolutionary architecture stacking and NMP. So we start from the CMOS device, as you know, and we fold the device. When we fold the device, what happens is that device footprint becomes single device footprint. It's about 50% reduction. Of course, there will be overhead, so it's not exactly 50%, but close enough. Because of um, device the footprint is much, much smaller, you can actually increase a certain um, bottlenecks um, where pinch point you can actually increase um, um, or relax a little bit, so CPP can be relaxed or contact area can be relaxed. So that's actually a performance um, potential there. Another one, depending on the integration scheme, you can actually use a different integration scheme for NMP. So you can use a different channel materials, which is a really exciting use for performance. 
Due to the nature of the stacked configuration, CFED requires a unique MOL. So you actually contact the MFED and uh, PFED into two different levels. Because of that, you actually have your uh, routing layer uh, a little bit of rotated. So five track FinFED to four track CFED, what you actually see is that the first layer, first M1 layer, is a fully utilized as a routing layer because of the unique middle of line of uh, CFED. And your pin axis is actually rotated about 90, 90 degrees. So your pin axis is actually going through this way. So it's a much larger aperture, which actually helps the routing congestion substantially. We confirmed four track routability using the place route experiment. So in this case, we use ARM core uh, in IMAC three nanometers. So what you are actually seeing here is the core area versus target utilization. The reference point is a five track nano sheet um, and the experiment was done is a four track CFAP. The one thing to notice is that CFAP backend was not optimized. So actually the target utilization cannot be achieved with this backend um, stack and we are continue to update this actually the target um, the backend stacks to improve the uh, utilization. But even limited utilization, you see about 13.3% of reduction of the core area scaling uh, compared to five track nano sheet. And we believe the full entitlement between a five track to four track using a CFET is possible by optimizing back stack optimization. Why is it possible like that, right? Because as we discussed before, mint is actually used in the CFET configuration as full first routing layer. So M1 actually is very depopulated. Unlike nanosheet, M1 is used as a first routing layer. M and CFET used the mint as the first routing layer. So M1 can be depopulated because of that routability is improved substantially and it actually motivates or it helps the area scaling of the block level. So this is actually encouraging news. We continue to understand our full track optimization with the backend together using the CFET. That's going to be the next step we are going to go. Of course, SGM will take a lot of benefit, right? So CFET by folding nature, we can actually reduce about 43%. What it really means is that SGM scaling is back into track. It's difficult premises before. Now with the six track, uh, six uh, devices in SRAM, you can actually continue to scale as we historically scaled before with the CFET. That potential is there, and we are very excited about um, seeing the potential of the SRAM scaling continued. So what are the key fundamentals we need to look at CFET? I think the two parts I like to look at is the performance potentials and integration complexity due to the all stacked configuration. So let's talk about CFET integration options. Roughly speaking, we can actually categorize the two big categories. One is monolithic CFET and the other one is sequential CFET. C monolithic CFET is that you grow from the bottom device and top device is one process flow. Sequential device actually is that you basically grow bottom devices and then wafer transfer or uh, wafer bonding and then actually you grow the next device on the top. So it's a broken down process. Monolithic by nature is a cheaper because it's actually one process flow and you can control the aspect ratio. So it actually can be shorter total stack wise actually than sequential CFET, which means the optimized parasitic effect of the resistance and capacitance. But at the same time, top and bottom devices are basically processed at the same time. The vo it's very vertical integration, it's very high aspect ratio of contact and the gate is actually needed in the monolithic. Sequential is a little different. Sequential is you can uh, make a more or less in the bottom device and then you create the top device. So you actually process is compartmentalized and then it's a basically lower aspect ratio of edge is possible still, except the middle of line, you gotta contact the middle of line as well. But at the same time, because your top and bottom device is processed separately, the thermal budget of top device is limited by bottom devices. So you cannot really have a high temperature anneal in the top process. So finding the right solution for um, top, um, top, de um, top devices is going to be important for thermal budget perspective. Just a little bit of a few key challenges of monolithic. Let's actually just touch base on this, right? 
Monolithic CFET vertical edge placement is important and actually it's very critical because of um, the nature of the vertical integration of the monolithic. So after you actually form the source strain epi in the bottom and contact, actually you do feel and you start exposing the sidewall of top device and you grow epi. The, basically the vertical edge placement is done by edge back and the CMP. The precise control is going to determine where uh, how much actually epi, uh, what kind of shape of epi, and where the location of epi is going to be. And if you actually do not control well, you actually expose the bottom device and top device in a short, um, uh, short path or open path in this sense, actually it's not aligned properly. So this is uh, one of the challenges for monolithic CFAT um, process. There are encouraging results of the monolithic CFAT so it's a functional result. There are still a lot of room for improvement. So top and fed in the nano sheet and bottom P fed with the fin fed as demonstrated and device actually is a switching like a transistor. So that's good news, but uh, resistance is high. So external resistance um, in the channel to the FP need to be improved and FP growth itself actually need to be improved as well as contact resistance. So there are a lot of challenges there and we got to continue to work on to improve the um, CFAT. Sequential CFAT is not a piece of cake either, right? So it starts from the wafer bonding and the defect in the interface, right? You grow, you basically start with the bottom process and then you deposit the oxide and then you do CMP and then bond the wafer, right? In the bonding interface is extremely important and the thickness as well. There are multiple competing impact in, um, in this actually the, um, interface first. The topography of incoming wafer is very important. If it's too rough, your quality of the interface is poor, so you've got to control very well. If it's too thick in the bonding oxide, what happens is that your actual parasitic is going to increase, so you are going to ha have a problem of um, degrading in frequency. So you want to reasonably thin, but not too thin so that you can create a defect, a void, in, a void in, on the interface. So there is a multiple uh, impact competing to each other, which need to be optimized. Recent progress i like to report from IMAC is that we actually find a window of void-free processes of bonding oxide thickness. So what you're actually seeing here is a y-axis is a bonding on dielectric thickness after CMP versus deposit silicon dioxide thickness. You can see that we actually have a window with a void free target process and we are very excited to see this is actually the right target process without impacting too much of device performance as well as actually uh, ensuring that the void free um, wafer pro uh, processes. One of the key features of the sequential CFAT I think is about the different channel material options. So it's possible to integrate NMP separate channels uh, in sequential fashion. So what we are looking into actually is whether um, strain after wafer bonding is actually wafer transfer is possible. So what we have done is experiment of uh, strain silicon. Strain silicon is grown on the silicon germanium and actually the donor wafer was given um, to IMAC uh, from the Soitec. So we use actually um, this wafer to transfer the strain silicon layers on the wafer and measure whether strain silicon is actually um, retaining the stress. And initially we started about 1.3 gigapascals and we uh, um, basically confirmed that the strain is uh, retained and we are very excited about um, the film actually uh, the transfer was successful so we fabricate the wafers um, the devices on the wafer and we compare the um, between the silicon channel versus strain silicon channel what are the impact so what you are actually seeing here is a subthreshold slope versus uh, peak transconductance uh, plots and the um, um, open, open symbols are actually uh, silicon channel and the, the field symbols are strain silicon and two different RTA temperature. What you are actually seeing in both cases at the given subthreshold slope, you see peak transconductance improves substantially, which means the mobility improvement actually is retained after the device processing. So this is a really exciting opportunity for sequential CFAT. So we are continuing the uh, key challenges of sequential CFAT. So we talked about the void effect, how to make a void free. And the second is actually how to uh, transfer the high mobility channel 
in the wafer bonding process and we actually demonstrate that. Third is actually the enabling the device with a low thermal budget and there are quite a few considerations we gotta do. One is dopamine activation, the RMG process and the gate reliability and the epi formation and by doing so it does not impact the bottom devices. So we found that actually low temperature laser on it can enable that. And what you are actually seeing here is the electrical readout for NMP devices. Um, for um, what you are comparing is that actually the, um, when arsenic and the phosphorus implant was done and for MFAT with the spike versus laser on it, there is no difference between the laser on it and the spike on it. A low temperature spike on it. The PFAT is the same. The boron was um, uh, implanted. You don't see much of an impact of the short channel nor actually the transport mechanism. So this is indicating that eczema on it can provide a viable path for low temperature budget uh, solutions for sequence CFAT for top devices. Industry are moving as well for sequential CFET. There are a lot of um, interest from industry, especially for Intel. There were two published papers last year in I, uh, IDM. One is actually FinFET to nano ribbon on an NMP configuration. The other one is actually gallium nitride versus uh, PFET silicon. So different channel solutions enabled, like, enabled by sequential CFET like a process is a high, um, highly interested, interesting for the industry landscape. So we will continue to look and investigate uh, further as we actually are um, looking at the device properties. So now the question is, what is the beyond CFET? What may come next? We think 2D material can actually offer a good solution beyond the silicon um, toward the sub nanometer technologies. 2D materials by nature is very thin, it's one or two mono layers, and the selection of the material choice have very low dielectric constant. So when you look at actual rough calculation of scale length, it actually enables channel length scaling. So the potential is there. And let's look at actually simulations to see whether the potential can be realized. So what we have done here is actually we did the NEGF simulation um, for uh, without parasitics. So to keep in mind, this is the intrinsic properties of the simulation-based model, right? So short channel characteristics is actually looked at here. So what you are looking at is a channel length. It's a screen that I off. So as you screen on the shrink the channel length, the silicon which is shown is black is going down because of your short channel is degraded, but you can see different color lines are different shock barrier of actually the 2D materials. They are continue to increase, which indicates that actually the short channel control is better. So you can continue to scale the channel length. Of course, shock barrier is very important. The higher the shock barrier, the gain is much less. Another part is the potential for materials, low field mobility. Looking at different type of mobility, which is 100 to 300, you can actually see um, if you find the higher mobility channels uh, in 2D materials, you can actually improve the short channel characteristics as well as actually the transport. So the potential is there. Question is whether we can find the right materials. Let's look at current progress. There are a lot of hot uh, discussions that is happening in the 2D materials and a lot of good progresses. So what I'm going to show is actually 2D uh, molybdenum disulfide based material characteristics published in 2019. What you are looking at is swing versus the uh, GM max. And in this work actually by, um, by um, IMAC, it's shown actually the very good transconductance with a superior uh, short channel con uh, control, the swing. So we demonstrate that best scale 2D material characteristics with the molybdenum disulfide um, compared to literature. So progress actually is made. Another part we cannot forget is actual compatibility for existing fab infrastructure. So we need to able to make a 300 millimeter fab uh, compatible 2D materials. So in IMAC, we multiple times to demonstrate that tungsten disulfide integration in the 300 millimeter fab. We formed the actually tungsten disulfide channel with the aluminum oxide the dielectric capping, and then create the devices that functional device was demonstrated. Of course, 2D material journey is just beginning. The challenges, the opportunities are humongous. 
So what you're actually showing here is actually same thing as what we've seen, algae versus on current. Different type of materials are looked at very carefully in many, many years. What's important characteristics are, to, um, I think it, for me, it's are three things. One, you need to be high mobility, and you need to be actually uh, show superior channel length and scaling. And third, actually, you need to be compatible with um, uh, 300 millimeter fab. In that perspective, tungsten disulfide shows the highest potential for um, among many other choices. Of course, we will continue to look at. So in IMAG, we are looking at the tungsten disulfide as a major candidate for 300 millimeter um, fabrication for 2D devices. As I mentioned, the challenges are enormous as well as opportunities. Contact, how to make a lower shock barrier is not really known, and we are continuing to look at it. Doping for 2D materials is essentially not known, and very important characteristics to look at. Gay stack engineering. We need to enable the very thin gay stack in the new materials, and that actually takes a lot of time. The last but not not the least is a high quality material fabrication in any kind of material system is very important and it's very time consuming and actually resource heavy. So we got to really look into these challenges very carefully to go um, move forward into 2D materials. The premises are there. So material side and the short channel side is there. But in the FinFET generation, you are competing another factor because stacking effect. Double effective for footprint is a very important manner. So 2D material should show benefit in the stacked configuration. So we did the simulation studies and see whether there is a value proposition. Is it compelling enough, right? So two part, 2D can scale the channel length as well as gate pitch or the VDD uh, option. So you can take advantage in both ways. But when you scale the gate pitch, does it buy us a whole lot? That's the first question. Another part is that 2D is very thin. Is that any opportunity for parasitic capacitance reduction? And we do see that. When we compare that, when we optimize the scaling further and further, we can actually see gain of the performance at constant power is significant enough um, to up to 60%. And that's where really our exciting uh, opportunity for 2D materials. Promise is there. It's not a reality yet. And the task for us is to how to make this as a reality. So now wrap up the device architecture. We talked about three different device architecture, fork sheet, CFAT, and 2D materials. Fork sheet is a natural extension to nano sheet, very compatible to nano sheet structure, except that actually dielectric ball. CFAT is a full D device and MP stack. And area scaling are potentially humongous, as well as challenges of the integration. 2D material is a really viable option for beyond silicon, but challenges of fundamental studies and material related is actually um, there, and we need to continue to tackle that issues. Now, third topic. Let's shift the gear a little bit. Backend. Backend is really important as we actually scaling further, right? As we discussed. Backend is continue to scale, right? So it's how I call rise of interconnect. One of the question is whether dual demogen is going to be possible beyond the 20 nanometer pitch. And I think patterning wise it's possible, but there are a lot of challenges and difficulties. And actually some of them are very fundamental, right? Because of the, you need to make a deep trench, the variability and complexity is going to be uh, very difficult. At the same time, the resistance due to the copper is going to be extremely important questions to understand when you actually scale down. So uh, a lot of challenges are happening in the dual damaging process with um, um, below 20 nanometer pitch. So alternative to the dual damaging process is called the substructive edge process. Um, so um, called actually the semi-demogen processes. So dual demogen processes, you actually do make a trench, you fill, and you CMP. Subtractive edge process, semi-demogen process is a little different. You basically depth the metal first, and then you etch out the metal, and you do gap fill. Because of gap fill is done later stage, you can actually very easily fill the um, gap with the air gap. And that's the one of the advantage of actually semi-demogen process. I will show a little bit later. So no trench etching. It's possible to select the metals with um, uh, no barrier liner because of it's actually done, um, the depth is done first and then etch out. Third, it's actually metal CMP is not needed, so variability is improved in this process. 
for iMac perspective, I think we want to enable beyond the 21 nanometer pitch using the semi damaging process. It needs to be self aligned as well. So the path to the self aligned semi damaging roadmap is very simple toward the lower RC uh, path, right? So, first, you use very high aspect ratio, so you introduce slowly high aspect ratio metals with the very least metals so that you can actually maximize the resistance reduction. But at the same time, you introduce air gaps so that you do not penalize the RC product. So capacitance reduction is, can be optimized as well. What you are actually seeing here is a 2018 publication that aspect of, uh, higher aspect ratio of ruthenium is possible and with uh, this process and actually we achieved up to the five and now we are going actually more than that. So we are very excited to share this result as well. In 2020, um, IMAC demonstrated two level ruthenium semi damaging process. Um, in this case, it's actually done in 32 nanometer pitch of metal pitch um, uh, vehicles. And you can actually see that the via of the ruthenium formed on the top of the ruthenium M1, and the M2 is actually very, very nicely etched. Air gap is formed in between the ruthenium line. What actually is amazing for us is that ruthenium edge can be pre-selective, very highly selective. Aspect ratio of 2.8 to 4 in this paper can be achieved. In this IDM, we are going to publish about the five aspect ratio of greater than 5 with a much higher selectivity to hard mass of the ruthenium edge process. And this is a really a um, viable path for RC reduction uh, using the semi damaging processes. And we are very um, eager to uh, see the next step. Another part of actually semi damaging process for me is actually design arc modulation of the design arc. So line and extension has been known uh, in the design community for restricting a lot of design space. So there, we need to actually have a design compactness versus the processability of the, um, the line end. So there is always line end we actually need to keep in mind when we design. In, in this early study, I must actually say this is a very early study, there is possible path for reducing the line end. And that's where actually we are continuing to focus on a little bit. In this specific experiment, we designed 21 nanometer extension and 0 nanometer extension. And we fabricate the wafers and then uh, measure the 1K via chain yield and the resistance. What we have seen um, in this experiment is that actually design 21 nanometers is in fact, it's actually 12 nanometer of the extension, so much shorter. And 0 nanometer is actually under on the left, it's a negative enclosure, to be honest, um, in the minus seven. So what was increasing is that the chains are working. It worked with a zero, zero nanometer extension. So that's really, really good news. But the resistance is very high. And you can see why, because it's actually on the left, right? So there are still a lot of room for improvement, a lot of alignment, and a lot of actually edge and uh, profile um, optimization is needed. But just the possibility that zero line extension is possible using semi damaging process is actually very encouraging news, and we will continue to look forward in the next time. Another important features in the back end I like to talk about is SuperVIA. SuperVIA is basically skipping one level of metal, so M1 to M3 rather than I'm going through M2. So it's skipping VIA and one metal layer. So because of that, it requires a very high aspect ratio of the VIA and it requires actually right material choices to reduce the resistance. So in 2018, we did a short loop experiment and actually we published this paper. Um, what we actually realized is self-aligning SuperVIA is not trivial. So there is a lot of optimization is needed and the thickening the tie nitride hard mask we can actually uh, confirm the good formation of SuperVIA and then good fill with the ruthenium with a very thin liner. Uh, is confirmed in this actually the 2019 uh, result. Now, I'd like to go one step further. What we actually like to confirm is that resistance reduction between a super via and the stack via. So all of this experiment was done in the 21 nanometer metal pitch uh, selection. So M1 to M3 connection. So one case is actually stack via. The other one is actually passing through the M2. So you skip into M2 directly connecting to SuperVIA. What we've seen is that in the median of the resistance is reduced by 2.4x 
for the super BR case. And both cases are using the ruthenium-based metals. And this is very encouraging news as well. So this confirms that actually IR drop of through the uh, super BR is possible. The reduction is possible due to the resistance reduction. But because of the nature of the supervia formation, it's very important in a design room perspective. So supervia cannot be too close to M2 next line, otherwise there will be a short. So we have seen of cases actually, if you don't have a right design rules, actually supervia is shorted to the next line of M2. So you need to uh, have some um, design uh, rules which actually uh, margin out the supervia process robustness. So we did actually experiment with the blocking certain adjacent track of the M2 near the supervia and see what other congestion look like in the block level scaling. So the first case is no M2 is blocked, so it's actually fully wired. Second case is actually three M2 is blocked, so one line is blocked and up and down. And the other one is actually five M2 track is blocked, so two lines and up and down is are blocked. This supervia is placed in the pro, um, power distribution network so that we can, we can do very easy assessment in the um, um, in the place route um, result. What we've seen is that when we compare the congestion in the y-axis y -axis in, uh, in the left-hand side and the DRC violation in the y-axis in the right-hand side versus number of tracks blocked in, in um, close to the supervia, we see up to three tracks. We don't see much of congestion issues or DRC violation issues. So this indicates that there is a room for uh, design um, design optimization up to the three blocks without impacting the routability, but still improving the resistance using the supervia in the power distribution network. Okay, very short discussion of interconnect, right? Interconnect is really very important. And I think thinking forward beyond um, dual damaging process is very important and semi-damaging with the ruthenium and air gap can really offer um, RC reduction as well as pitch scaling. And in addition to that, Supervia is actually offer nice solutions for routing congestions in the block level scaling by skipping one metal or two metal layers. And if they, it can be done, it's actually going to be very exciting for routing solutions. Early visual indicates that actually a very promising result for the resistance reduction compared with the stack via, and actually there is a room of the design room uh, optimization near the super via vicinity to um, improve the routability as well as the resistance. So we have a look at many options in technology to enable scaling further to one nanometers and beyond. So this is exciting time, there is no doubt. Yeah? We are very excited to see next step uh, for these architectures and validate uh, the validity of this actually the element. Since we are talking about validity of this element, it's very important how to measure this. What do I mean by that? Before, we actually don't have to know all the steps across where we need to go. Material side, device side, circuit side, and block side, we can optimize within themselves because we know what metric and optimization within area actually translates very nicely in the product-like design. What we actually seen is that for good example is a BPR and backside PDM. Disruptive innovation does not uh, work like that because you cannot really do circuit-based, standard cell-based simulation because then you are not going to see the tap cell impact. So you got to go to the block level. So this full circle is needed in order to evaluate the disruptive innovation. Yes, this is very good because it's like a product-like performance, but it's very time consuming. It's very, very expensive process when you have a multiple choice and actually multiple permutation of the technology elements you got to work on. So our task is finding rapid and accurate power performance benchmark, which we can use technology evaluation. So one end of the device and the simple arrow level, which is the accuracy is poor, but really fast. The other end of the place route, accuracy is high, but really time cons um, the turnaround time is too long. We need to find a solution where it actually um, resides. Accuracy is high and fast uh, solutions uh, for the technology valuation.
We believe Composite Arrow can provide a solution very nicely. Composite Arrow is basically a suite of arrow reflecting critical path of the block and uh, reflecting the backend sensitivity and load. And this is very fast but very accurate. What we have tested is the 3 nanometer base um, the reference of the composite arrow accuracy. What you are showing, what I'm showing here is the frequency ratio with respect to IMAC uh, 3 nanometers versus area ratio. The blue is the place route result and black is composite arrow. And in both a simple arrow is actually shown in the uh, red open circle here. What you can actually see various of technology option is tested and you can see that blue and blacks are much, much closer than actually red. Indicates good agreement between the place route result as well as um, and the composite arrow result. So composite arrow can actually offer a good solution for methodology perspective, rapid and accurate performance benchmark. So very short snapshot, right? I think we need to find the best way to evaluate the technology solutions, much more product-like design. And Composite Arrow can offer nice solutions, and we will continue to investigate more to make, uh, develop the robust methodology to um, evaluate technologies. OK. Wow. Congratulations. You are done for 80 minutes. Rather than, you know, Talking about conclusion, what we just went through, I really like to talk about my ending thoughts, right? I love to get your feedback as well. First, for me, what jumps out from this uh, tutorial prep preparation is that there is no way out. It's all hands on deck. Technology element for device architecture, performance, the middle of line, interconnect, that's not sufficient enough. It's all alone. You got to think together. So enabling scaling, you got to actually combine them together, find the right solutions. Not enough to find the solution, you got to evaluate. So get the right tool for the job is important. Fast but accurate, a product like a um, performance benchmark is going to be important. And finding the robust methodology is going to be a key task for technology research and the development. Third, let's keep an eye on the price. Our price is not technology scaling. Our price is system scaling. Along with the CMOS technology, um, there are many other technology pillars we got to work together. So co-innovating across the diverse technology is going to be a really important task to uh, make next generation, um, next generation computing possible. And that's a very exciting opportunity. Last but not least. I think this work cannot be possible without many of um, my IMA colleagues. Uh, so thank you so much for all the contribution for preparing for this tutorial. Most of all, thank you so much for your attention for this 80 minutes. This can be really long and this can be very short. For me, I have so many things to talk about and discuss with you. So it's actually a shame we cannot meet. I wish you all the best and stay safe and until we meet next time.